We are blessed today to have uh, Matthew Gibson from uh, Virginia Humanities. He's the executive director of Virginia Humanities. And he's going to be talking to us about the humanities. What are the humanities? Why do they matter? And we'll be thinking a little bit about some of the uh, challenges facing the humanities today. All right, so Matthew, let's start with the big question. What are we even talking about uh, here? What do we mean by humanities? That's a great question. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Reverend Justin, for having me to talk with your community today. Uh, it's a pleasure, certainly. I live up the road, so I you know it's leaving at 9 o'clock, but I know I can get here in time. Um, so the human what are the humanities? That's always a fun question to, to answer. We actually, Virginia Humanities did a rebranding process back in 2017. And the folks we were working with at the VCU Brand Center went out actually on the streets close to VCU. And they started interviewing young undergrads, you know, they asked them blatantly, you know, bluntly, what are the humanities? And it was fascinating the kinds of answers that you get. Things like, oh, you know, you do things in a humanitarian way. Uh, we you know it's, it's, yes, there's a center of humanness in that, but it's, it's a different kind of uh, project altogether. Uh, things like the SPCA come up a lot um, and giving to animals and helping animals and, and things like that. Be, it's not what it is. Be humane. Be humane. Yeah. Exactly. And that, that's sort of a, 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 I think, a byproduct of being human, hopefully. Um, but I think for, for our intents and purposes, especially when you think about higher education, the humanities are a series of disciplines, even though I don't like to use that definition when I talk about the humanities. But it's basically things like English and literature, uh, languages, history, anthropology, although there are people out there who would say it's not anthropology, that's a social science. There are divisions within anthropology that are more humanistically focused. Uh, I'll ask you, ask you all out there, who has a major, a degree that you would say is humanities-based? Ah, look at that. So art history, not art, because art's more practicing. Art history is the interpretive component. Although where I come from, Virginia Humanities, we call ourselves a public humanities center. And by that, we mean that, you know, in general, we don't believe that the humanities only exist behind the walls of the academy. That they're a part of our daily lives, and in some ways they're so ubiquitous that they're invisible, right. right? And I think that's in some ways part of the problem, part of the challenge that the humanities have. They are invisible in their ubiquity, but in a definitional sense, I think the humanities are an exploration of the human experience through the written and spoken word, and the spoken word can be many different kinds of things, and the written word can be many different kinds of things, be it internet, be it uh, radio, be it you know, video. Those are the kinds of things that we delve into when we talk about the human experience. Good. All right, so in a sense, it's about what does it mean to be a human, right? That's and right. it has a variety of different disciplines, you were saying. Um, maybe this is an obvious question, but it's worth, I think, unpacking. Um, why is it important and valuable to figure out what it means to be a human? Well, it's funny you, you ask that. I, I was wondering that today, this morning, uh, just I, mean, I, have, I have my own understanding of what, what, why it's important. Yeah. But I actually asked ChatGPT this morning, <laughs> why are the humanities critical to society? And it gave this nice, nice curt answer. The humanities are critical to society as they foster critical thinking, empathy, and a deeper understanding of human experiences. They contribute to cultural enrichment, ethical reflection, and the development of well-rounded individuals. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's a little bit more than that. I mean, obviously, that's that's a nice, you know, succinct answer. Um, I, I think if, if you think about society in general, society is a human construct. If you think about our nation, our nation actually, in its founding, um, and I'm talking about the founding in the in the 1770s, not well before uh, with First Peoples, um, but I believe that you know that was a humanistic experiment, right? So it's, it's, our nation was founded as a as a conversation and a debate around ideas of what it, what justice means, what our constitution would be, what our laws would be, those are important aspects of our lives together. Um, I think coming together in a in a faith based community like this, understanding that you know we're not reduced to being human beings are not reduced to being the product of what we create every day, mm -hmm. right? We have a there's, a, there's a higher purpose that connects us all. There is empathy, there's a need for understanding. 
Um, I think there was a, in 2017, and I've referred to this several times, but in 2017 there was a, a writer who came to the Festival of Book, uh, Nathan Englander. Um, he's a Jewish American writer, and he wrote a book called Dinner at the Center of the World. Um, and it was actually this kind of like, we've, we've heard about the tunnels in, in Israel, right? Uh, and it was actually this idea that we had to create a new space in some ways to actually create peace, to actually come from two different ideas, two different truths, and come together to create a new truth together. And that was actually a new sort of imagined, even though it's not imagined, place where someone from Palestine, someone from Israel could actually come together and have dinner with one another because they love one another. Um, and I think it's that sort of need for compassion, um, for empathy, uh, that elevates who we are as, as human beings. Be above, above and beyond the sort of need for, you know, profit, for capitalistic output, those types of things. So you're saying in a sense that there's something more to the human person than just being an economic um, being, uh, a consumer, something more than what we produce or own, um, and the humanities is kind of an exploration of that. What is that more? And you were pointing to certain sort of values and norms that I think are almost intuitive for us as humans, kindness, compassion, so of course there are other values and norms that are also intuitive to us that are less uh, helpful for society. Um, well, that sounds great, um, Matthew, but I understand from you and from you know, my own life and experiences that the humanities are in decline, and that's the term you use with me. That's right. Um, why would the humanities be in decline if it's so important to figure out who we are? No, that's a great question. Um, I think there are several reasons. I, I mean, I, I think there, there's been the statement crisis in the humanities has been around actually since the 60s. Um, it's sort of like a, a phrase. It's had some ups, some sort of, uh, it's gained some traction, that kind of crisis mentality over the years, and then it's, and then it's had a decline. And now, of course, it's in a upswing again. Um, but I think this time it's it's kind of uh, it's it's more real, if you will. Um, I mean, we, if you look at any newspaper, watch Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, whatever, you'll see something, some op-ed about the decline in humanities, decline in humanities majors in higher ed. And I think that's actually where you're seeing the decline. It's in higher ed. People aren't majoring in the humanities, right? In the public sphere, and I'll talk about the public sphere in a second. It's very different. Um, but I think ultimately the reason for the decline in people majoring in humanities goes back, unfortunately, to the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Uh, when you had people realizing, and especially, actually it's a conflation of several different things. It's, it's that recession where the economy, where making money became obviously a scarcity mindset where we had to make more, we had to actually be, we had to create a living for ourselves. Uh, we had to make sure that as we were getting an education, we were coming out of that education with an ability to create a living for ourselves. But I also think it's a conflation with a lack of public investment in higher ed, in a liberal arts education. I think for many years you've watched state and federal government reduce its investment in higher education, in education. Um, and especially around the liberal arts. I think in some ways you had um, President Obama actually emphasize STEM learning during his administration. And that became sort of a call for people to maybe put the humanities to the periphery and focus on STEM. Now the other aspect of that is because there was a lack of public investment in education from state, federal governments, et cetera, you had um, universities investing more in private donors to actually make sure that they were sustained. Um, those private donors have done great things like build a data sciences center at UVA, which actually is, I think, a humanistic enterprise, even though it's also combined with sciences. Yeah. Um, but it's also created a, 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 a space in which to maintain those new buildings, to maintain the faculty that actually work in those buildings, you've got to increase tuition because the state's not going to help you do that kind of work. Right? even though they've also invested in those capital projects. But I think what happens then is you get out, a student gets out of, of, higher, of, of their four-year college or two-year college with a great amount of debt. Yeah. Right? So they're thinking to themselves, how can I, what's the, 
quickest way I can go make money to pay off my debt, maybe think about you know a, a, a life like my parents had, maybe owning a house or at least being comfortable, um, being able to pay my bills. And so I think that is, has has made the humanities kind of a peripheral, invisible um, product, if you will, because I think it is about product in some ways. So you're pointing to some significant economic concerns that are driving this decline in interest in the humanities. Um, is that true, though, in the sense that if you major in, say, philosophy, um, that you're likely to make less money than somebody who majored in psychology or, uh, right. or you know, <laughs> whatever? It's not uh, true. It's not true, actually. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a truism to it in the sense that in the first couple of years of getting out, if you're like an engineer or you're in business and doing hedge fund stuff, you're going to be making probably six figures within your first couple of years of, of work. However, there was a study by the Americans uh, for the Arts and Sciences, uh, a sort of think group based out of, out of uh, Cambridge, that looked at sort of the, the long sort of tail of humanities degrees. And they were seeing that people who were, who were majoring in, in philosophy and English and history, who have that critical mindset, who have an ability to communicate really well, writing and, and speaking, um, who have a skepticism and a curiosity about the world that I think is necessary for human ingenuity, um, they're actually making between sixty and seventy thousand dollars in the first few years of them being out. They're not all going to, and this is not disparaging Starbucks, but they're not going to Starbucks to be barista, right? That's not exactly what they're doing. They're actually finding long-term employment, and so I think there's also a marketing message that's been that the humanities have not been really good about highlighting. Um, and within the next you know, decade of that humanities career, you also see this level of, of satisfaction with jobs and growth in jobs, so that people with humanities degrees typically go on to more leadership positions within whatever sector they're working in, versus, you know, and this is again, it's not disparaging engineering and, and STEM. I think in some ways, what we've done terribly in higher education is to segregate those two disciplines. Right. I think really, if we get back to a more liberal arts-centered sort of construct, and I think EVA, I think many of the colleges in, in Virginia do that really well. Uh, Jim Ryan and, and Provost Balcom completely always invest in that idea of liberal arts and the whole human being. Um, I'm not a shill for, for Jim or, 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 or Provost Balcom, but, but I, I believe that they, they really invest in that, that liberal arts kind of construct. That is actually the core of what I think higher education is. And I think we've done ourselves a disservice by by removing ourselves from that interdisciplinarity that's so required for us to be human beings. De-emphasize sort of the general um, approach to knowledge. What does it mean to be a well-rounded yeah, person, right? right? So there's so much specialization in our professional lives that we are downplaying the importance of, well, yeah, you need to take some science classes right. and some history classes and math classes. <laughs> and, um, I went to William and Mary, they had the same thing. Yeah, totally. uh, you know, we, to graduate, we had to take classes in all the different disciplines. Right. Let's, um, so we've been talking about some of the economic things, and those are talked about, uh, I think, quite a lot in the media, too. Um, but let's, let's look at some of the sort of more metaphysical, if we will, or uh, intellectual challenges that the humanities are receiving. And I'll start with one that I hear from kind of the more conservative end, <clears throat> which is that the humanities is no longer interested in truth. Um, that it is um, post-truth, post-modern, um, that everything is about power dynamics right. um, and uh, social dynamics and the quest to kind of understand who we truly are, what is the beautiful, mm -hmm. Plato would ask, what is the good, yeah. that that quest has been lost in um, the humanities. Yeah. This is coming obviously from the more intellectual side of the right, but uh, sure. what would you say to that Respond or that uh, criticism. You know, I would say yes and no. I, I think, I, I think certainly. Um, I mean, the humanistic endeavor is is is, is, is if it's if it's truly about things like truth, yeah. that includes values like justice, that includes values like inclusivity. I believe that the humanities. And I think if we're truly going down that humanities path and investigating why some people don't have pure, true access to 
our justice system in a way that other people might, then you definitely get into questions about power dynamics. However, if it's solely about that, then it also isolates the humanities from what they are also doing. I think it's a, it's a multifaceted project, the humanities are. Um, but I think if we're also ultimately gonna talk about beauty, happiness for everyone, then we have to in some ways talk about the power dynamics that keep, the, in which systems keep people from having greater access than other people to avenues of happiness and truth. But again, those are, I would also say that happiness and truth is only being defined in those contexts through economic, mostly economic terms, right? Not our sort of faith-based terms, not our spiritual terms, not our metaphysical terms of, of being a human being. Um, and so there was an article actually in the Atlantic, I think it was last month, about, and the, the, the headline was something like, why the humanities and higher ed have been the, the, the origin of their own undoing. And it was basically pointing the finger at administrators who would hire politicized faculty in the humanities. They, they made, there was a tongue in cheek sort of, maybe it was real. Um, we want an anti-racist Shakespeare scholar, okay? Um, that's, that's a huge, <laughs> that, that's an interesting thing. So this, this, this author was blaming uh, the administrators for trying to find relevance. In other words, how can the humanities be reduced to having a relevant impact, right? And by, by relevant impact, they mean, oh, it can be used as a political wedge. And I think that certainly does a lot to um, remove the, the larger value of the humanities. And if you're looking for the humanities to be just a, a, a practical end, then you don't know what the humanities are. The humanities are not about practical ends. You know, a, a colleague, a friend of mine, Ed Ayers, and I talk a lot about the idea that the humanities can prepare you for things like, um, you know, job preparation, you know, career preparation. But at the end of the day, what the humanities really do is they create a mechanism for life preparation. I think that's, if, if we solely focus on just the output of what the humanities can give us in the realm of politics, in the realm of, of identity, then we're doing a huge disservice. And it's not, it's not that those are not true and real. Because in our humanistic endeavors and our questions and our curiosities, those issues come out and play in great ways. Obviously, if you, you know, living through the 60s, I didn't live through the 60s, my mother lived through the 60s. Uh, and, you know, the civil rights era, that's not a thing that is not real. And it's still not, it's still very real today. Uh, but, but I think what you're also saying, Matthew, if I hear you correctly, is that there are philosophical, <clears throat> intellectual underpinnings to those things. All right, for instance, and this is not actually taught much in um, elementary school, middle school anymore, but the civil rights movement was yeah. deeply influenced by Judeo-Christian values and worldview. Um, people forget that, you know, Dr. King was a reverend, <laughs> was a minister, and most of his writings his entire approach to how the civil rights movement worked was rooted in the love ethic of Jesus, right? Yeah. So what I, what I heard you saying, too, was that um, the humanities invites you to get to those deeper sort of principles and values and philosophical assumptions that um, are at work in people's worldviews. And once you've kind of interrogated those things and really focused on them, got, got some clarity about them, wrestled with questions like, what is justice? or what is peace or what is the good life, then you can more appropriately and effectively start to apply those principles to the world. I, I suppose that the critique, though, is that that theoretical side is, is being downplayed for just the practical advocacy stuff. Right? right. I think that's right. And I think going back to the, the Nathan Englander uh, point about the, I don't think I finished uh, back in, uh, when he was, I think it was 2017 in the Book Festival. Yeah. And he came to talk about this book. Uh, the center of the earth, and somebody in the audience asked him, you know, you know, what 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 do you, what do you see as the resolution of, of that conflict, and what do you see about the United States right now within that kind of like polarized, truth wielding sort of conflict? And he said, you know, ultimately the Palestinians, the Israelis, they believe in two different worldviews, they believe in two different truths, and to solve that, you need buckets and buckets of empathy, right? And, and it's not that empathy creates 
a realm of agreement. It's just that you can actually remove the labels from people. You can remove the, the sort of categorical just, uh, definitions that you put a group of people in and begin to see people as human beings. And so I think, you know, going back to your question around, um, around the sort of politicized humanities, the sort of like, if you, said, if you go back home and you're an undergrad and you go back home and you tell your parents, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm majoring in English, I'm majoring in philosophy, and they're like, oh, you're one of those progressive leftists. That's not, you know, I think what, what's, what's happened here is if, 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 if you're in the humanities and all of a sudden you, you begin to say, this is true, then, you've, then I think you've done a disservice to yourself and to the humanities. The humanities fundamentally are based on curiosity and skepticism. They're always invested on thinking, I don't actually know, but I'm going to continue to investigate the truth. And I'm going to continue to investigate and talk to my fellow human beings about what they believe. Even if I may not agree with it, it helps me understand the complexity, that beautiful complexity of what a human, the human sort of like family really is. Um, another critique that I've heard um, and found myself sort of wondering about too, especially with, I think, younger people as we um, become a more secular society in many ways, is um, what scholars will call scientism, right? Scientism is the idea that all truth is reducible to scientific questions, which sure. of course is a, a philosophical um, circle is begging the question, but we won't get into yes, that. Yes. Um, but that's a very common thing, yeah. a kind of, um, well, if it's not mathematically provable or empirically provable, it's not true. Sure. It's not even a, a worthwhile question to ask. Right. Um, we have, in many ways in our society, continued to reduce the human to um, simply a material entity, a physical entity, yeah. right? Um, people will speak of consciousness, for instance, as merely epiphenomenal. It rides on top of the neural processes, right? Right. So you are nothing more than chemical and neural <laughs> processes in your brain. Totally. And, yeah. and you might think that you have this really interesting interior subjective life, but you're deluded. Um, <laughs> no such thing as free will, right? Free yeah, will, right? Yeah. Free will is an illusion. Um, I mean, we, we all hear this stuff regularly. And it seems that one um, byproduct of that, if, if, if you accept that view of the human, is that you might wonder, well, what's the point of majoring in the humanities. Uh, shouldn't I study physics or chemistry or biology um, so that I can really understand you know, what a human is? Because we're just material beings. Right. Um, we're just physical processes, chemical processes. And if I can understand that, then I know what a human is. Uh, this might be sort of the critique from the left, if you will, yeah. about why someone might not care that much about the humanities. It was, it was funny, I was, in undergrad I was reading uh, this essay by F. Scott Fitzgerald, I think it was called The Crack Up and other essays, and, and he, there was, he had this exact point uh, in that essay, it might have been a short story actually, um, where he said, you know, if, if maybe, maybe I am reduced, all my actions are reduced to the chemical processes, the, the, the sort of uh, hormonal processes that are going on in my body. Um, and I look at the body of, of his literature, I look at the body of all literature, Wow, if that's if that's what that is, then um, well, that's a sad state of affairs. I mean, it's not a sad state of affairs, but but I think it's a little bit more. Uh, obviously, I think the human being is a little more complex than just um, than just a you know an equation that has an answer. Right. Uh, if that were the case, then um, my wife and I would never have an argument. <laughs> just ask Chat GBT. Right, exactly. What is Matt? If I say this to Matthew, what is he going to say? Right. Or if I say this to Jennifer, what is she going to say? I, I, you know, I, I uh, it's an interesting, that's an interesting, um, scientism is, is an interesting kind of, uh, I think philosophy, I think, I think um, but I think it sort of misses the boat about the mystery of what it is to be human. Um, the fact that, and I think it's the, I think if, if you, there's a lot of hubris in that too. I think if, if, if we, I mean, one of the values that Virginia Humanities has is, is humility. And I think if we have a sense of humility, a sense that we don't know, and also a sense of curiosity and creativity, then, um, then, then we don't reduce ourselves to a world of black and white. Where I mean, not 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 in the sense of identity races, but but I mean in the sense of oh, there's a right and a wrong, and I can identify that through an equation or through a chemical process. 
But I imagine, and I, I agree with you, of course, uh, or I wouldn't be sitting here uh, yeah. <laughs> serving in this church. Yes, exactly. Um, but I suspect that if we were to go down to UVA and talk to the neuroscientists there, sure. they would say, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, we're just physical entities. Sure. And, and you know, we're trying to figure it out. And um, So that view is so prevalent, right? And particularly in certain circles, and I think in university circles especially, um, that I imagine it, without maybe thinking about it, it's, it's shaped a lot of how people uh, approach these questions and it makes, in a sense, STEM seem more relevant. Right? No, absolutely. I, I think that's true. Um, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, I think if, uh, if you've ever sort of sat outside by yourself and looked up at a night sky and I mean, yes, you can explain the universe, and people are beginning to explain the universe in much more meticulous ways, and black holes and things like that. But I think you look up at the night sky, you sort of see the human, the relative human insignificance of your own persona, and you have to wonder to yourself, what, what, why, what, why, why am I here? What's, what's the connection between me, my family, my community, this big black hole of the night sky? Um, I just think that there are larger questions that uh, that that that, that Maybe can't be answered. And I guarantee you, every each, the neurologists you speak to aren't going to be able to answer every single one of your questions. Right? Yeah. I mean, they, they can't reduce you to me. Well, I could ask them <laughs> what what is consciousness, and they would give me the answer. Absolutely. Say, show show me how that's the case. And they, well, actually, I don't really know how these neural processes electrical synapses somehow you know. create the subjective you. Yeah. I have I have no idea actually, but yeah. it's my working assumption, right? Yeah. Um, and then how do our life experiences actually shape us as human beings versus... But I think, I think one of the things you're getting at, Matthew, is that the humanities invites you to think about the assumptions that are at work. I, I, one of the things that strikes me is um, how philosophically uneducated we are as a society. That we haven't really grappled with questions like, how do we know? Yeah. What does it mean to know? Uh, what actually exists, right? Yeah. Um, what assumptions suppositions are behind any worldview, and looking at your own worldview and being like, all right, what are the, what are the things I'm, I'm actually assuming? Right, right, right. Even right. the way I approach truth and knowledge. And in my experience in life, it's the humanities that taught me to, to ask those questions, be curious, humble, skeptical. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can remember vividly in, in a philosophy class when I first read David Hume's critique of causality. And I realized I, I didn't even have any way to know that anything causes anything else, right? And it was an assumption, right? It's an assumption I make every day of my yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. But, but to be able to question that, and, um, and it seems that in a way, what we're saying is that every person, even if you don't major in the humanities, needs to be exposed to that questioning. And it's not irrelevant. Like, it's actually the most fundamental questions you can ask as a person. I think so. I mean, the an undergrad, the first semester in undergrad, I read uh, Plato's Mino. Um, of course, the, the central figure is Socrates, and he's talking to these people about, you know, these sophists about what is happiness, what is truth, etc., and they have an answer. So I think in some ways, maybe society is, is moving towards that more sophistic, um, especially people in power. And I think... Uh, I don't think that does a great thing for our pursuit, our humility, our, our curiosity, to know that there's an answer. Yeah. Um, that's why you have faith, right? I mean, faith is a, it's, it's a leap of faith. You don't know. Um, and I think fundamentally that's that's a very humanistic. Well, I'm question. taking a leap of faith that you're a real person. That's right. And I'm, and I'm not in the matrix right now. So, um, so we, we all do that every single day. Um, I think it's a good time to turn to questions. Uh, what questions do you have for Matthew? Come back. Uh, I may have missed this in the end. I'm just curious. What is your teaching focus? And then, like, what, you, what is your academic specialty? Yeah, what's your sure. Uh, I'm a generalist, actually. I, so I'm the executive director of Virginia Humanities, which is the state's oh. humanities council. Um, I, I used to teach English, uh, and also I also used to teach computer science work. So I come from sort of a, I, I sit, my background's digital humanities. So looking through sciences to investigate and interrogate humanistic questions. Not to answer them, but to continue, you know, uh, answering them or thinking about them. Uh, so that's, that's sort of my background. Um, 
but I've, I've been at Virginia Humanities for, yeah, actually, I, I think I, I wanted to, thinking about my own career, going back to the late 1990s when I was getting my PhD, first of all, recognizing there's no jobs in the humanities, a terrible thing. Um, but uh, important for people to know if they're going into the PhD program. Uh, but also realizing, I was actually working at the library at the time. And when you look at the, you know, Alderman, Alderman's just reopened, um, but when you look at the power of what a library is, it's sort of like uh, the, the sort of well of all human voices that sort of, there's a, there's a great book um, called The Library Book uh, by, by Susan Orlean, and it's about the library fire in, in Los Angeles in the 80s. And she talks about this idea that you can go to the library, you know, it's a very quiet place, very isolated place, and yet you are part of, uh, part of millions of conversations that are happening. And so I think when I was in the library, I recognized the work I was doing in the library had more public impact than the work I would ever be able to do as a tenure track professor. And so that's why I sort of went into the public humanities. And in sort of talking about the public humanities, when we think about all the sort of questions, and they're, they're questions of politics and power, but when we think about literally what's happening in our, our town squares around monuments, Whatever you believe, whatever side of the aisle you, 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 or not aisle, but whatever side of that conversation you find yourself, the contest itself, the debate about historical meaning and how we represent meaning, that's a huge humanities question. Right? How do we represent our history, our collective history together? And why are you taking my history away from me? Maybe we should be thinking about it more as, as our, all of our, our collective history. Um, but anyway, I think that that's an interesting thing. And, and, I would also say that any news article you read, whether it's about Palestinian and Israeli conflict, it's all, so much of that is based on humanistic questions and pattern history, right? Um, anyway, that's great. Thank you, man. Yes, Bob. Um, uh, I should start by saying I have a uh, Jesuit liberal arts background. <laughs> One of the books we had to read this freshman, and I've given it to my grandkids, is The Little Prince. Oh, can you talk about that a little bit? You know, I would if I if, if I have, it's been it's been I think I was like seven when I or eight year, years old when I, when I last read that. Um, but ultimately, I think if I remember correctly, it's about just not knowing, right? Yes, not knowing and then learning from the fox who has all the wisdom. It's what you see in your heart, not with your eye. And, yeah. Uh, That's and not I great. Think the Jesuits <laughs> have this whole thing about, Jesuits have this thing about head and heart. Yeah. It's just not your head. That's right. You process through your heart. And that's <laughs> what's sort of getting out of what you're talking about. No, that's absolutely. And, or, and, and I think in a, in a in a less spiritual realm, it's your gut, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I reflect on when George W. Bush said it. I don't know. I lead with my gut most of the time. But actually, I think a lot of people lead with their gut, with their heart, right? Um, and that was not a... That was not a Political endorsement of any kind. <laughs> Maybe you could say instinct. I don't know. It's, Absolutely. Uh, uh, I know. I do one other thing. I work with numbers, and I hate numbers. <laughs> but I love process, and yeah. that's what I learned in my liberal arts classes was to think through a process and and refining the process and making it more efficient is a hell of a lot more fun than making a balance sheet balance. It always balances. Numbers is a number, but the process is what makes it. Interesting. It's so true. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting when you think about the humanities. I, 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 unfortunately, the humanities, it is, a, it is a business in higher ed, right? The number of majors you have in a particular discipline equates to how much money that department will get, right? It's a very easy balance sheet. Um, so if you're somebody like an undergrad who's double majoring in, let's say, uh, engineering and history, they're probably going to look at history as your second major, which means it doesn't end up on the balance sheet. So people are getting this well-rounded education, but all of a sudden, where they're getting their second major is getting defunded because it doesn't equate to an investment of cash, in, literal cash, into their department. Um, so, but, but thinking about your, your perspective of, 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 of process, that kind of critical mindset is, is taught through all that sort of those liberal arts disciplines, right? I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, right there. Um, so I'm thinking about your comments about the critique, the sort of post-truth critique, and also the scientism critique. And 
what comes up for me, especially regarding this concept of intellectual humility, is that there's something happening now where we're not thinking as individuals, we're thinking as a group. Yep. And um, I think the way the world has changed in the last, you know, technology in particular has really influenced that. I guess my question for you is specifically regarding public humanities is what's the role of the humanities in uh, either encouraging or discouraging group think? That's a good question. Um, I think it's um, I think it's it's, it's a series of, of of repetitions in the sense that if if we are constantly if Virginia Manus, for instance, is constantly funding uh, community projects based on with a scholarship, then right? I mean, it's based on an investigation of truth. It's based, it's invested in humanistic methodology. But if they're, if they're investing in the search of their own local history, and if we can promote and amplify that history to other people across the state and beyond, and we continue to do that in every region, then I think that does help to tear away those kinds of groupthink labels. I was reflecting this morning about you know, the world of hypertextuality, right? the World Wide Web. And that's where I got it. I, I got in the late 90s, I started working in the EVA library um, in this place called the Electronic Tech Center. Mm -hmm. It was digitizing a bunch of classic literature texts, basically, and putting them online. This is before yeah. Google, this is before Project Gutenberg. Um, and the idea that, the, the initial idea of the World Wide Web was that it would be a democratic connection to increasing our knowledge, to increasing the investigation of our knowledge, because everything would be interconnected, right? You, you'd go, and now, of course, we have Google, but um, but you'd go and you'd find something and hyperlink out to another resource, hyperlink out to another resource, and you can read a book now on your Kindle, and you can look up somebody who's mentioned in a biography, and it'll bring up a Wikipedia page, and it sort of recreates that hypertextuality, right? But I think we've got to, the World Wide Web, in some ways, is, and this has always been, this is what the, I think it was inevitable, has, is, no, is no longer that large universe. It's a bunch of rooms now, right? So social media, when you look at things like Instagram or Facebook uh, or Reddit or other types of enclosed systems, that she's gotten away from the spirit of what the World Wide Web was because they could create that, right? Because those, and typically there were, they were humanities you know, people who actually were CEOs of these companies that created these, not always. Um, but now what's happened is those, 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 those rooms are no longer attachments to potential avenues of investigation and knowledge, but they're just self-enclosed echo chambers, right? Um, because you're gonna, you're gonna affiliate with a, with a person or a group that thinks like you do, instead of actually using the World Wide Web. And, the, and I mean, I think life is hypertextual, right? If you truly see one person, that one person connects to a node here, connects to a node there, connects to a node there, whether their career, their family, their life, their genealogy, we are we are we are we we are vast you know universes within ourselves, and I think that was the promise of the web, and that promise is completely different now. Um, you know, you had things like twi I mean, Twitter, you know, and now X. X. You know? I mean, if, if you if you've ever had a productive conversation in Twitter, let me know. Or, or X now, uh, it's just not. Um, yeah. What you're describing is a de-democratization of the commons, of the right. information of access. And that's a, a, a word that you haven't touched on in this conversation, is democracy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, you, we talk, I, I, talked, I mentioned it sort of in the beginning when we talked about the sort of founding documents, the founding of the nation, right? As a humanistic exercise. It was an exercise in humanities degree. You know, I mean, basically all these all these founding fathers, if you will, were were educated based on the, the, the classical sort of like forefathers. They were all fathers, all white fathers. But um, the, the, those sort of like ideas of of freedom, of happiness, of pursuits of those types of things. And again, recognizing there was that conflict of having of, of people owning people at that time, which I think is something so certainly. Uh, an important thing to always remember, uh, but you had that initial um, creation of a constitution that was a living, breathing thing 
right, that could actually adapt over time if the people willed it to be so. And they have. You look at the 12th, 13th, 14th, 19th Amendments. Um, but I think when we think about the humanities and democracy, we think about civic engagement and the lack of civic engagement right now. Civic engagement is based on a knowledge of our, of our community, a knowledge of our history, and how do we deploy that knowledge into being active participants in the future of our community. It seems like one of the things you're pointing to with both of these questions is kind of a lack of a shared worldview almost. Um, you, you refer back to the, sh the worldview of the Declaration, for instance, um, the idea that we are uh, endowed with certain inalienable rights, a remarkably uh, philosophical and religious statement um, at the heart. Um, it seems as though, based on what you've been saying, that uh, we're moving into these little um, ecosystems where we're kind of sorting ourselves, or even doing it where we live, right? We're not living around people who think differently than us more and more. Um, and we don't have that kind of shared set of norms and values yeah. to gu even guide a democratic conversation, right, Sam, as you were getting at. So it's a, how, how can the humanities help us recover that and stop falling into these sort of subgroup think patterns that we no, have? That's, it, you know, that's, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer, to be honest. Well, I, that's I mean, what we brought you. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna take the value of humility um, and say that I don't know. Um, but, but it's, it's interesting, what I think is also interesting about your question, Sam, is that you know, democracy, the term democracy itself, in, in some circles is now, yeah. the term itself is politicized. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, you, and you, actually, I'd like to think about democracy, the humanities, and journalism all together in sort of a three-legged stool of our future. You look at what's happening in our, our, the way we get our information, um, the fact that our papers are in decline, our news is in decline, at least traditional traditional news is in decline. The daily progress is, you know, a skeleton of what it once was, being bought up by, you know, vulture funds, hedge funds that um, come in, they look for profit, they tear it apart to gain that profit. And the news be damned. The investigative part of the news especially. I think, if, uh, you know, the, the humanities at the end of the day are about information. Right? They're about the, and the sort of way we interrogate information, the critical processes we use to be able to, to, be able to doubt the information that we're getting, but also to, to hopefully create an ecosystem in which information is well-researched. Again, thinking about that methodology of what scholarship actually is, that's interrogated and that's available and accessible to many people. And when, when, you, when you begin to erode that, that estate, then democracy and the humanities also become very unstable. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think that, that there's a tripart sort of relationship between journalism as a adjacent humanities discipline, right? If you think about journalism as a sort of first draft of history, um, the humanities and democracy are all interwoven. And I think if, as you see one, not to be doom and gloom here, but I think if you see one in its heavy decline, is that a canary in the coal mine, or is that a wake-up call to make sure that we're actually trying to uplift um, that infrastructure? So in a way, then, if we were to resurrect, if I can use that word, uh, the journalism and the media and make it more about the pursuit of truth um, and doing the kinds of things that uh, the humanities does, that might actually have a positive effect of increasing the investment and interest in humanities at universities. Is that the basic thrust of your... I, I think so, I think so. I mean, again, I, within the university system, I don't know. I, I don't have a solution for that. I do think that there is a movement within the university system, if you can divorce it from the politics of, of, the, of, the, of Congress and the courtroom, um, there's a move within the university system to, to double down on that liberal arts sort of like uh, foundation. You, uh, President Ryan just sent out a video uh, welcoming students back, um, and he talks a lot about that need to have conversations, the need to really, the, the education of being an undergrad isn't necessarily always in the classroom, it's actually with your colleagues. And it's actually disagreeing with your colleagues, finding areas where you do, not even agree, but just understand. Right, and I think that that is a humanistic endeavor 
uh, when we think about what's happening in journalism right now, there are a lot of positive signs. You've got things like Press Forward, which is a $500 million investment from the MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, and other foundations in local journalism. That's not enough to do it. And so we, as, as in the state, actually we're working with the Karsh Institute right now, uh, as well as the Virginia Funders Network, which is a consortium of, of funders across the state, to think about ways and prioritize ways that journalism can be invested in by corporate and private foundations across the state to create sort of a statewide press forward. Um, and there are lots of different nonprofits now looking at ways that we can continue to invest in you know, investigative journalism, uh, which I think is a, is a good sign uh, ahead. And I, I will also say that within the public humanities sphere, again, I mean, you've got the Festival of Book, you've got the Film Festival, which is not ours, you have the Film Festival, and you've got a lot of people coming to those because they love, I mean, certainly to be entertained, but also to have, to have something in front of them, a personal narrative, a human experience that, tests, that, like you said, tests your assumptions about the world you live in. And I think if you're not, te if you're not testing your, your own assumptions, Try to wake up every morning and start. <laughs> That's a good uh, comment to end on. Um, let's give a round of applause to Matthew. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be done. Yeah.